it's my pleasure today to introduce Katie. Um, some of you might not recognize Katie because she's somehow gotten through the Moss Landing program in two years um, and spent a lot of that time in the field. Um, so I'm excited for her to share her work today. Um, I met Katie under, just under three years ago. She approached me about wanting to join the lab. We had a meeting and talked about um, some possible project ideas. Um, at this meeting, uh, I discovered she had a non-traditional background. She actually had a degree in American studies and a minor in writing, um, and she'd found her interest in biology um, more recently and had gone back to school and taken some classes in biology and physics. She had done an internship at the Hawk Mountain uh, Raptor Sanctuary, Sanctuary, where she started to do some work with Caracaras, which she's gonna talk about today in the Falklands. And so she came to me with a bunch of different ideas um, and figuring out kind of how these animals get by in the winter, what their potential metabolic rate is. Uh, we decided, okay, well, here's some papers, here's some things to read, um, we can meet again. And she came back with an email two weeks later with four questions, ways that she could answer these questions. We met again, she had decided, she'd actually met with one of Scott Schaefer's students and talked about building her own data logger. So the next time we met, we were kind of moving forward with the idea that she wanted to use accelerometers to measure their behavior. Uh, and then I think I met her one last time before I accepted her. I was in San Jose for a, another meeting. We met at a coffee shop and she'd actually brought the little data logger she'd already built. So at this point it wasn't hard for me to take her as a grad student. We'd had really one conversation and she was running, running with a project. Um, so it's been a pleasure to have Katie in the class. She's really been motivated and sought out collaborations and gone to workshops and used online resources to develop the tool set that she needed to do the project that she's gonna present today. So with that, I would like to introduce Katie so she can tell you all about her work. Okay. Hello everyone, and so, Thank you all for being here, and as you're all now well aware, today I have the privilege of defending my thesis research titled The Seasonal Time Energy Allocation of an Island Restricted Falconet, the Striated Caracara, using a low cost, open source, inertial movement GPS logger. It's a mouthful. <laughs> so I hope this presentation is as joyous and fulfilling for all of you as I'm sure it will be for me. <laughs> and without further ado, let's get started. So, in many environments, animals are faced with seasonal fluctuations in resource availability, due, for instance, to migrating prey, or changes in prey vulnerability, or pulsed resources. And life history theory predicts that animals are well adapted to their environments and have adaptive strategies that they can use to respond to these fluctuations. And these responses can include migrating to areas with more resources, prey switching to what's available, or reducing their metabolic needs. Now, when human settlements are introduced to a natural landscape, it can disrupt this natural pattern of food availability uh, by providing resources when and where historically there were none. And I refer to those as human subsidies. So human subsidies are generally predictable in space and time, which makes them easier to access than natural resources. Examples of these are dumps, campgrounds, and anywhere humans live and produce excess food such as trash, compost, or animal feed. Most of the work looking at the impact of human subsidies has been at the population level. Two examples include bird feeders increasing the, excuse me, bird feeders increasing the breeding success of the New Zealand kakapo, and fishery discards impacting seabird dispersal and thus abundance and density. Then, if you go to the community level, you see altered species interactions, for example, increased nest predation of ground nesting birds near feeding stations, and increased human wildlife conflict, such as long line entanglements of albatross. On the individual level, we know body mass, survival, and space use can be impacted, but much less is known about how human subsidies impact the underlying mechanisms, such as energy balance. And why is this important? Well, organisms have finite energy and must allocate it to competing life functions. When time, effort, and energy use are used for one purpose, it diminishes, it diminishes the time, effort, and energy available for another purpose. In other words, animals must make the best possible choice in any context for where to invest their energy. And an imbalanced budget can lead to fitness consequences. So thus I've arrived at the question I'm answering for my graduate thesis. <laughs> 
How do energy budgets differ seasonally in a landscape with fluctuating resources and human subsidies? So let's move now to where I conducted my research. The Falkland Islands are a three-day, 7,500-mile journey into an area of the South Atlantic that's about 300 miles northeast of Cape Horn. I've been fortunate enough to go to the Falklands for my research seven times over the past three years, which is why <laughs> Gita mentioned that you might not recognize my face because I've been there quite often. I went to the Falklands to study the striated caracara, which is a near-threatened scavenging predator that's endemic to this area and also to the extreme southern coast of Patagonia. Populations in the Falklands present an ideal study system because they're fa they face dramatic seasonal fluctuations in food availability, and they've only recently had human subsidies introduced into the natural landscape. They're also very little studied. A cursory Google search of Falcobanus australis will give you 350 results, and if you narrow that to the Falklands, you get 152. And that's uh, compared to, say, the peregrine falcon, and if you Google them, you get 27,000 results. So there are some conservation implications to my research as well. It's also ideal for graduate student research, <laughs> because as the name implies, it's the southern walking falcon. So in addition to being social and inquisitive, they're also really easily approachable. Colloquially, they're called Johnny Rooks, and so I may use that term interchangeably in my presentation. Apologies, that's what I call them every other time of the year. So caracaras are falconids. While they share a subfamily with true falcons, they really seem to be everything that true falcons are not. They're social, they walk with ease on the ground, and they have a somewhat labored and heavy flight. They're sort of like amped up chickens. <laughs> and they rarely soar like true falcons. Striated caracaras are one of 10 in the caracara family. And you may be most familiar with the northern crested caracara that has a Central American range that extends into Mexico and the southern United States. The rest inhabit South America, and they fill the same ecological niche as crows and ravens which are actually absent in South America. This is a relative comparison of global uh, striated caracara populations. And you can see that caracaras are the little bat in green, the global population of turkey vultures are in purple, and uh, southern giant petrels are in red. So uh, there really are very few striated caracaras. These are the Falkland Islands. It's roughly the size of Connecticut, and they're comp comprised of 778 islands. The bulk of the 3,300 person population lives in Stanley in the east. Striated caracaras inhabit the western islands and a little bit of the south. This is how I landed on Saunders for my research. This is a privately owned island which supports an estimated 150 caracaras. In Austral summer, Caracaras primarily feed on eggs and chicks of colonial seabirds that inhabit the islands. These include black-browed albatross, penguins, shags, and burrowing petrels. They also feed on the afterbirth feces and carrion associated with colonial pinnipeds, including southern sea lions and southern fur seals. The concentration of these resources varies from island to island, but at least one of them predominates on all islands that striated caracaras inhabit. Oops, that's backwards. In the austral winter, caracaras face a very different energy landscape, as most seabird prey leave the islands and do not return for several months. Caracaras, however, remain in the Falklands, and they must switch to other available food. Before humans arrived in the Falklands, winter resources likely included soil and kelp rack invertebrates, limpets and small fish from the intertidal, pinniped feces, and occasional bonanzas of carrion that wash ashore from the sea. But since human occupation began in the mid-19th century, some caracaras have begun taking advantage of human subsidies. For instance, on Saunders, the number of caracaras, particularly juveniles, swell in winter, where they compete for farm resources, such as animal feed, compost, and offal. You can see all the caracaras lined up on top of the shed there, waiting for the hens to be fed. So remarkably, I've seen up to 180 caracaras at one pig feeding during winter. This was a case where two pigs were fed two geese in an open-air enclosure. And if the global population estimates are correct, this event attracted roughly 4 to 8% of the global population. That's a lot. 
So my recent publication of our long-term movement analysis confirms that caracara habitat use does differ seasonally on Saunders. The non-breeders and juveniles spend their summers at the seabird colonies that I mentioned, that's in the upper left, where they maintain an overnight social roost throughout the summer. When their seabird prey migrate offshore, they move to the settlement where they have a second overnight roost. They then stay primarily at the settlement throughout the winter until the seabirds return and the food at the seabird colonies increases. Now, if human subsidies were able to compensate for seasonal prey loss, I would expect the caracaras to have similar activity patterns and energy balance at the farm settlement as they do at the seabird colonies. However, our movement analysis found that their winter ranges were seven times larger. Additionally, we saw their body mass decrease 14% in winter. These results are what directly led me to this research. I wanted to know what is happening here energetically. So this leads us to my primary objective, to investigate the time, energy, and activity budget of a species facing seasonal fluctuations uh, in resources in the presence of human subsidies, which led me to my secondary objective, which was to design an affordable data logger that can record the data that I need. And beyond being economical, what better way to understand the data you're collecting than to design the logger that collects it? So before I get into my data logger design, I first need to explain what it is I'm trying to measure and why. So my research is based on the idea that movement is going to be the most energetically costly thing that an animal does. It will be higher than the cost of processing food and higher than the cost of basal metabolic rate. The reason that movement is a good proxy for energy is that to move, animals contract muscles, which requires energy, thus the proxy. So the way to look at movement is to use three-dimensional acceleration. Now, when you record an animal's acceleration, you're actually recording both the animal's movement and the effects of gravity, which are always acting on an animal. A metric that has been developed that removes the effect of gravity is called overall dynamic body acceleration, or ADBA. ADBA has increasingly been used as a energy proxy because it linearly correlates with metabolic rate across many taxa. For example, the top plot shows a linear correlation with oxygen consumption for a polar bear that is walking on the treadmill in the lower left. This is also, the bottom plot is for a grizzly bear which is uh, engaged in the same activity. This has also been used for cormorants and many other bird species. Okay. So lastly, I wanted my logger to, report, to record GPS data that I could use to help interpret activity and space use. So now I know that I need to build a data logger that has uh, the capacity to measure acceleration and GPS. So let's take a brief detour into data logger development. This is a land I never thought that I would visit. <laughs> but as Gita mentioned, I was inspired by students in Scott Schaefer's lab who tailor-made accelerometers to measure turn nest disturbance a few years ago. So first to outline my needs. I wanted to make an affordable, lightweight logger that used open source components. And I needed it to be capable of recording high resolution data. I also needed an analysis toolkit for the data that's collected by my loggers. So to meet these needs, I turned to Adafruit for my hardware needs. Uh, this is a company that produces printed circuit boards and uh, design schematics and documentation that's all open source. For my software needs, I turn to Arduino, uh, which is a company that provides microelectronics resources uh, and also tutorials, project ideas, and an active community. For my analysis software, I used R, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And again, that's open source and has a really thriving community that offers expertise and support. So the one thing that all three of these have in common is that they're learning communities, and I am a huge proponent of this. So I committed to making my data logger design, my program code, and my analysis toolkit publicly available on GitHub. So here's a glimpse into the, ta the tag building process. After many iterative improvements, <laughs> the build process reduced to two hours, only requiring a minimal soldering station and steady hands. And this is the final product, not true to size. <laughs> Uh, which costs $90. Uh, it, this is the microprocessor, which has a micro USB port and a micro SD card for onboard storage. Uh, 
These are the inertial movement sensors in the GPS unit. The default sampling parameters are 50 hertz for the inertial movement and two minutes for the GPS movement, but you can set it to additional sampling rates. With a 500 milliamp hour battery, it's capable of sampling for just over 35 hours. And it's archival, so it must be retrieved to access data. This shows the orientation of the sensors when the logger is tail mounted, excuse me, tail mounted to a bird. X, Y, and Z measure forward, backward, side to side, and up and down, respectively. And combined, they represent three-dimensional movement. Here are two examples of a time series of triaxial acceleration data in the lower right. Now, the first thing I need to point out is that the scale of the Y axes are different. On the left, the Y axis goes just above eight, and on the right, it goes just above 20. But I had to change those so that you could really see the effect of the signal. So, the left is from a bird perched motionless. The right is from a bird in flight. And you can see a clear difference in between the overall magnitude of the signal of the bird on the left and the right. Perching, because it involves almost no movement, has signals of lower overall magnitude, which makes sense. If you're perching, you would expect it to be less energetically costly. So ADBA takes all of this into account uh, as a proxy for energy expenditure. I'm happy to talk more about my logger, uh, the design and the capabilities, but I want to leave some time for my primary objective. So now I have an appropriate tool to uh, answer my question, so let's head back to what I'm trying to answer. So how do energy budgets differ seasonally in a landscape with fluctuating resources and human subsidies? Well, based on our previous knowledge of winter mass loss and increased ranges, I hypothesized that winter might be a time of higher activity for the caracaras. So I predict that in winter, caracaras have higher daily odds of values, they engage in higher intensity activities, and they travel more on a daily scale. So I've already described Saunders a little bit to you, but now I'll go into a little more detail about my two study sites. My austral summer site is a three and a half square kilometer cluster of seabird colonies at a low lying 300 meter wide isthmus that connects heath covered uplands. Six species of seabirds, including king, gentoo, rockhopper, and Magellanic penguins, imperial shags, and black-browed albatross, all breed there during austral summer. And the caracaras associate most closely with the gentoos, the Magellanics, and the rockhoppers, which combined have a estimated population of 30,000 individuals. So in addition to the eggs and the vulnerable chicks that they feed upon, they also forage on carrion washed ashore from the sea, like this shag on dead or dying adults, including this gentoo who escaped a sea lion predation. And they also feed on the abundance of kelp fly larvae that inhabit decaying kelp rack. The larvae form a stable, high calorie component of their diet. And unlike when foraging for carcasses, they dig for these peacefully, shoulder to shoulder, and for hours. So my second study site, the farm, is 16 kilometers to the southeast of the seabird colonies. It's operated by a family of four and two coworkers, and this is where the caracaras overwinter. So although the climate is seasonable, it's maritime and remains within a narrow band of negative five to 24 degrees Celsius. The family maintains approximately 6,500 sheep and 200 dairy and beef cattle. Five sheep are processed each week for family consumption and to feed their animals, and the offal is cast off for scavenging birds. The chickens and ducks, roughly 400 of them, are cage-free and roaming. And as I mentioned before, there are two pigs that are fed two geese daily, which in the winter attract quite a bit of caracaras. My observations indicate that it is this pig feeding, the weekly sheep processing, and the bones that are given to the 22 farm dogs that are the primary lure for the caracaras in winter. What's important to note is that these are high calorie opportunities for the caracaras. This is not junk food. It's also important to note that these are scavenging opportunities and the caracaras otherwise cohabitate peacefully with the free-ranging farm animals. So now let's get into trapping and logger deployment. So here I am trapping with the wife of the island's owner. She's in the lower right. Clockwise from top left, I'm setting the carpet noose trap, which is a series of snares, monofilament snares, that are tied off to parachute cord and staked to the ground with a shoulder of mutton. Uh, 
And then as the walking falcons, true to their name, <laughs> walk across the trap to access the food, they snare their tarsus. And that's what's happening in the upper right. And once a bird is snared, I quickly move to release it, just the lower left, and then I process it. And that, that includes taking morphometric measurements, banding them, and affixing a data logger to the two central tail feathers before releasing. And that entire process takes less than 10 minutes. These are what the loggers look like, taped to those two central tail feathers. The loggers are 22 grams and about the length of your pinky. The birds wear them for 24 to 30 hours, and after which I easily retrieve them. <laughs> or at least that's the hope. <laughs> Actually, while it's very easy to indiscriminately trap caracaras, it is extremely difficult to trap the one specific bird that's wearing your data logger for your master's thesis. <laughs> so I use a single snare, I use ribs on a screwdriver, grease cubes, cunning, and a whole lot of patience uh, to get these data loggers back. They are very smart birds, and I must outwit them. <laughs> so this is the island's owner and daughter, and when they're able, they help me retrieve data loggers, which, for which I am forever grateful when I'm at my wit's end. But thankfully, I've mostly been successful, and of the loggers that I've deployed, only one remains at large, which by now has fallen off either uh, through tape deterioration over time or naturally during the bird's molt cycle. So in all, I was able to collect high resolution, acceleration, and GPS data from 12 individuals at each site. This I did over four seasons across three years. Okay, so I have this acceleration data. First, I need to process it to ensure regular sampling. Then I downsampled it to one hertz to facilitate analysis, and then I clipped it to comparable 24-hour periods per individual. All right, now I need to calculate the metric that I told you about earlier that's a good proxy for energy. So I take the accelerometer data, I subtract gravity from each axis because that's always acting on an individual to different degrees, uh, depending on body posture. And after that, you're left with the uh, true motion of the animal. In other words, there's this baseline around which all animal movement occurs, and that baseline is gravity. And so once you subtract that gravity, you're left with this creme layer, which is the true movement of the animal. And so it's that creme layer that I'm after, and that's the odbometric, or that forms the odbometric. So once I have the dynamic acceleration in each axis, I take the magnitude, and I sum them across axes, and that gives you odba. That's the metric I want. So using that metric, I calculated daily odba totals per individual, and then I calculated daytime hourly odba rates. I also used a hidden Markov model to infer behavioral states from my acceleration data uh, because they're very effective at dealing with the autocorrelation of time series. HMMs comprise two processes. One <clears throat> is the observed time series, and that's my animal movement metric. That's my odba. The second process is the hidden state. And there are two key assumptions. One is that the probability of being in a state depends only on the immediately pre preceding state. And two is that the distribution of each observation is completely determined by the activated state. And my odd values were positive and continuous, so I used gamma state-dependent distributions to inform my model. I first considered a simple two-state model, and then I built complexity until a reasonable goodness of fit was achieved, but such that the model states were still biologically interpretable. I used GPS data and ecological knowledge to help validate my model, and then once I had my model results, I calculated time spent in each state to create activity budgets. I used the GPS data to calculate daily space use. I used three calculations. First, I described individual landscape scale movement by calculating the step length or distance between subsequent two, excuse me, or the distance between subsequent two minute locational positions, because remember that was my sampling rate. Next, I calculated the cumulative daily distance uh, as the sum of step lengths. And lastly, I described seasonal space use by estimating the 95% home range and the 50% core area of use. My statistical analyses uh, for my seasonal differences were I ran a two-way ANOVA with season and year for all response variables, year and the interaction, inter excuse me, 
here and the interaction were not significant, so I proceeded with two sample t-tests. And then I used appropriate non-parametric tests if assumptions were not met. So to remind you of my question before I get into my results, how do energy budgets differ seasonally in a landscape with fluctuating resources and human subsidies? Now, I love this plot. <laughs> Mostly because it shows a strong signal, but also because it reminds me of the snake that swallowed the elephant in The Little Prince. Wow. <laughs> so for those of you who know what I'm talking about, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. <laughs> um, it's been a lovely reminder to stay open and imaginative through this graduate research process. <laughs> but to get back to my figure, this shows dial and seasonal patterning. Um, excuse me. I got excited about the snake that swallowed the elephant. <laughs> okay, back to my figure. This shows dial and seasonal patterning of Adba binned by solar hour. Each bird is a thin horizontal line. The thick horizontal line represents the mean, and shading denotes night, which is solar dusk to solar dawn. So right away, looking at this, it appears the characters are more active in winter. But Winter days are shorter, so it's hard to know if this is actually true. Regardless, we can begin to see that there's a strong dial pattern across both seasons. So, are they actually more active during the day? Yes. <laughs> it turns out that daytime hourly adva rates were almost twice as high in winter than in summer. But winter days are 34% shorter, so maybe it makes sense that they were uh, more active to maximize daylight hours. So I want to know, on a 24-hour scale, are they working harder in winter? And yes, <laughs> when you sum ADVA across 24 hours per bird, I found that ADVA totals were on average 20% higher in winter. Now thinking back to the dial patterning, they're twice as active during the daytime in winter when they have six hours less daylight, meaning they're really working hard to maximize those daylight hours. Now, Let's look at the state classifications that emerged from my hidden Markov models. I found a four-state model to best fit the data. These were rest, rest with noise, low activity, and high activity. Rest describes sleep, or close to it, which is what's happening in the upper left. Rest with noise allows for slightly larger variance for activities that intuitively look like resting behavior. For example, resting during the day that can also include preening or just like a higher uh, level of alertness. Low activity, excuse me, low activity describes walking, digging, and other less demanding activities. That's the lower left. Uh, it includes the less demanding activities, whereas high activity includes flight, running, and antagonistic behavior. So using these different behavioral states, if we go back and look at our data, what we find is that rest is what's taking place at night. Regardless of season, Karakara spent over 90% of the night in the resting state. That's even though winter nights are twice as long. So for the remainder of my analysis, I'm only going to be looking at daytime when they're active. Okay, so when I just look at day, in the simplest model, which combined the resting states and the active states, I found no difference in the total time spent in activity. I did, however, see a difference in the time spent resting, which makes sense. One's got to give when the days are longer. So the extra summer day length is spent resting. When I broke it into the more complicated model, I found the same trends for both types of rest. And then what's really interesting is when I broke out the activity into low and high, I detected that caracaras spend two hours more in the low activity during summer and one hour more in the high activity during winter meaning they spent more time intensely active in winter. So in order to look at what might be behind this difference in activity, I looked at space use. In the winter, they're primarily focused on the farm, which is on the left. Part of their increased activity might reflect increased competition. But when we look at how they're using the habitat, you can see that in winter, they're using a lot more of it. Even though they primarily use the farm settlement, they occasionally fly to the seabird colonies to take a look. So between increased competition at the farm site and flying to an alternative location, they're expending more energy. Whereas in the summer, they're using a much smaller range. I saw it reduced to less than a tenth of what it was over the winter. 
the entire summer range is encompassed actually within the uh, circle on the right, which is my one of my 95% KDE indicators. Additionally, uh, this summer plot, um, sorry, let me back up. The smaller range means reduced flight time. And additionally, you can, well, you can kind of see on the southern end of the beach there at that isthmus, that's where you see these really high aggregations, or excuse me, high accumulation of kelp rack and the kelp fly larvae that they spend so much time uh, in this really relaxed sort of foraging mode. And so that could account for the higher low activity durations that you're seeing during summertime. So it's worth noting that both in the summer and in the winter, these range sizes align with what I found during longer three-week deployments. And this means that the patterns that emerge over time also hold on a daily scale. So you can see the effect of larger range and more widely distributed resources at the farm settlement when we look at cumulative daily distance traveled. In winter, the Caracaras doubled the distance they covered through the day, from 11 kilometers in summer to 24 kilometers in winter. So what does all of this mean? Well, as mentioned before, animals use different strategies when faced with food scarcity. Many small mammals and some birds use torpor, and this is when they reduce their body temperature and metabolic rate, like this ruby-throated hummingbird, which has slipped upside down in a torpid state, <laughs> or this tawny frogmouth, which is one of the it's the largest bird that engages in torpor at 500 grams. Other mammals hibernate, and since you all might be bored with an example of a black bear, I thought I'd show you this really cute, fat-tailed dwarf lemur, <laughs> which is actually the only uh, primate that's known to hibernate. Much larger mammals use conservative foraging strategies and reduce their locomotor activity, like this endangered Mongolian wild horse trying to survive the winter. I think this is the reduced locomotor activity, not the alternative foraging strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but caracaras seemingly employ none of these strategies, none of these energy-saving strategies. And assuming their primary motivator for movement is food, this suggests that they're foraging at higher intensity during winter than summer. This maybe explains the reduced body mass we observe in juveniles overwintering on saunters. So the abbreviated use of the farm settlement is another atypical response to human, to human subsidies. For example, some stork populations in Iberia are actually foregoing migration and opting to stay at dumps year round. That's where they've established residency now. Similarly, trumpeter swans in the Rocky Mountain region of the United States are thought to be foregoing migration to take advantage of feeding stations. And then for non-migratory species, one typical response is to uh, reduce the home range and then to also move that home range closer to the human subsidies, which you see in corvids in the Mojave Desert and then also in the Pacific Northwest and in the San Clemente Island fox. Caracaras, on the other hand, they leave the settlement as soon as possible. They have not become year-round residents and they have not reduced their range sizes near the, near the human subsidies. Instead, they leave as their natural food source increases. And what is their alternative if they weren't using this human subsidy? Well, on Steeple Jason Island, 80 kilometers to the northwest of Saunders, which is a nature preserve that does not have human inhabitants, they hunt for terrestrial invertebrates. You see them all digging shoulder to shoulder in the upper left. They forage in the intertidal, or they scavenge at Gentoo colonies. So the same resources that these caracaras are using through the winter on other islands are also still available on Saunders at the seabird colonies site. Could they be meeting their energy needs there without the increased cost of flight and competition that they incur at the farm settlement? So it's true that there's high quality food at the farm settlement, but they have to fly between here and there much longer distances to access it. And there's a big payout if you're successful, but it could be more costly than the natural alternative. So it holds across taxes that there's no such thing as a free meal. So when considering these results, I must acknowledge a possible selection bias. While it was necessary to sample juveniles to avoid the energy costs associated with breeding, this means that I'm also sampling an age class that may be experiencing their first winter. These are young birds. They might still be learning the best strategies for how to survive, for learning time management, efficient foraging skills, how to compete effectively. 
So maybe I've just gotten a really great measure of growing up. <laughs> but uh, the next step then to answer this would be to look at the adults and what are they doing, uh, which I plan to do in future research. So my main takeaways. In winter, juvenile care carers are working harder. Even when human subsidies are available, I found they're more intensely active and have a bigger range. Is this a maladaptive response to human subsidies? At this point, with this data set, it's really hard to say whether human subsidies are negative or not. What we've really found is that they're working harder. But we don't know if this is just because winter is hard or if this is a mal maladaptive habitat selection that's led to increased competition and foraging costs. So in order to figure this out, I'd like to expand this research to a comparative study of adults and to islands without human subsidies to disentangle the effects of food scarcity versus human subsidies. Sounds like a good PhD, doesn't it? <laughs> and not only will I continue using the TW logger for this, but uh, it's currently being used in an ongoing project on squid energetics down at Hopkins. Uh, and, it's, and my fellow lab mate Parker is also adapting it to deploy on emperor penguins for his thesis research. So it's super exciting to see these expanded applications of the TW logger. And I'm really excited to see where else it can be used. OK, so um, with that concludes a very exciting, very challenging, and very fulfilling few years of work. Uh, thank you so much for your support and being here today, and also for the extremely generous support that I received along the way. And there are many people, many, many, that I'd like to thank, including but not limited to all the folks at Hawk Mountain, um, the Moss community, excuse me, the Moss Landing community here, and my thesis community, Hopkins Marine Station, and all the support I got there with Dave and Max and James and the Saunders landowners who took me in as a daughter of their own over the past few years, um, all of my mentors uh, and all of the funding and collaborators. Thank you very, very much. So um, with that, I would like to take your questions. If anybody has any questions. Yeah, John. Um, I was just curious, has there been much of a change in the population in response to like, any sense of what it was like before there was the human provisioning available uh, and how, how, is, how is that impacted? And also, maybe related to that would be how has the human habitation affected some of those natural sources of food availability? Great question. Okay, so. Human settlements, if you saw in the, let me go back to that um, map really quickly, where the Karakaras inhabit. Sorry, this is a bit jarring. There we go. Oop, no, that's Saunders. Almost there. Here we go. Okay, so you'll see that the Karakara range has been pushed basically to these outer edges. And there are historic records, like in the 1800s with explorers seeing Karakaras further east. But uh, as with raptors the world over, they incurred quite a bit of persecution and were shot extensively by the farmers because of perceived conflict with wildlife or with livestock. And so that, in addition to humans hunting one of their primary prey base, which was the heavy sealing operations, that depressed the population dramatically uh, right upon the arrival of humans. And so we know that they're not at historical levels, but we also have a really tough time having baseline information about the population size. We know that some of their range has expanded a little bit eastward, as I've seen on Saunders, which is this, during my time, the past nine years, not been a breeding island, and just this past season, I found three nests. So that's good news, but we really don't have a nice baseline comparison to say if the population is stable now or uh, what the population size, how it compares to when humans arrived. And did I answer both questions in that? Okay, thanks. Otherwise, I forget what your second question was. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so have you ever, ever tried to do an energy budget to understand whether the energy that's available to them in the subsidized areas equal to or less than what's available to them at the colonies? Yeah, so there, you can look at the comparison of the caloric value of uh, geese versus the caloric value of penguins and seabirds. 
uh, and those are comparable. Um, I don't actually have the numbers with me right now, but um, that's why I mentioned that the options at the farm settlement are actually really high calorie, and I think that there's just not enough food. So I haven't actually done a direct caloric, I haven't actually measured intake, but I do see this increased competition, and I don't think every individual is benefiting from those really high calorie options that are available there. Max. So you're using ADBA as an energy proxy? Yes. And uh, the linear relationship between energy and ADBA has only been validated within locomotor style. So that relationship is gonna be different for walking than it is for flying. Right. And your, your snake that swallowed a elephant plot is really convincing that there's drastically more right. activity. But do you think that that also means that they're spending more energy? Or do you think the fact that they're doing these two locomotor styles like how, how robust do you think your results are to the different type of proxy? That's a great question. So I think when you're looking at the cost of transport, it's been established for species outside of the Caracaras that the cost of flying is much greater than the cost of walking. So I feel fairly confident that even though I don't have um, specific uh, proxies for each type of activity, that um, the signal that I'm seeing holds. I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. Yes? Uh, I noticed that you're using the solar day for like most of your things, day versus night, but it seemed that in both summer and winter, they woke up an hour and a half before day started. Yeah. I was wondering why you wouldn't include that in like their, like make it instead of solar day, make it a awake versus rest cycling. Yeah, um, I just used it so that I could have a comparable measure because otherwise it gets to be quite subjective as to when you begin um, measuring their, their movement for the day. And so, and what I think that we're seeing there is that they are rousing and um, the early bird gets the worm type of thing when the sun is rising. So they're trying to be the first ones to get to the resources in the day. So you are seeing them leave the roost and that really big spike in Adba is that flight where they're leaving the, the roost. But I just, I chose the solar day just to, so I have an objective measure that I can compare between seasons. Sean? Uh, just your observations in your study, did you see adults early in the same activities, like just on your own? Yeah, so the adults that I'm seeing in summer on Saunders are generally non-breeders, and in the winter, they, I think that there are some breeders that are coming in. Um, which is totally irrelevant to what you just asked. <laughs> but um, I do see some adults, and what, I'm, what I think I'm seeing is some younger adults that are participating in these activities. But otherwise, adults tend to be a little bit more standoffish. You get these huge juvenile gangs, is what they've been called in the literature, uh, that all move together and kind of create this big ruckus. And the adults are like, whoa, I'm going to stay away from that because I already know how to do this way more efficiently than all of you guys. And so you don't see them involved in these big um, feeding frenzies. They seem to have figured out their own sort of, um, there's a paper that one of my colleagues is publishing in, um, of a population in Staten Island in uh, the Southern Cone. And he's talking about inter-individual niche specialization. So it does seem that by adulthood, they've sort of established, okay, this is gonna be my, my way of getting food. That's all of them. <laughs> yeah, thank you.